Join Hans Moser on an adventure through the greatest mountains of North America. In the 1950s and 60s, Moser's films attracted tens of thousands of mountain lovers across Canada and the United States. Ski the glaciers of the Caribou Mountains. Savor steep spring snow at Rogers Pass. Climb to the highest summits of the Yukon and Alaska. Inaccessible, remote, and alluring. Establish new routes in the Canadian Rockies and climb to the spectacular summits of the Bugaboos. Join some of the greatest skiers of the era, Mike Wigley and Jim McConkey. Enjoy the freedom of mountain skiing. No lift lines, no other ski tracks, just fresh air and good exercise, pure fun. Great friends sharing great adventures in the most beautiful places on earth. It was an era of leather ski boots, beautiful sweaters, and long straight skis. But they still could ski pretty well. Usually. Experience the pioneer days of heli skiing the deep powder snow, and the tumbles. Ski the untracked expanse of Canada's glaciers and suffer the cold of high altitude climbing. Through these films, return again to Hans's unique mountain world, not seen for 50 years. Hans took us to places we had only dreamed of. No doubt, this is what most everyone wishes for when he thinks about skiing. Beautiful country, beautiful snow, effortless turns, linked in a never-ending succession. As long as we can take advantage of gravity, our skis are very mobile. The warmest temperature today was too below. We didn't bother to measure it during the night. The snow is extremely hard, almost like ice. The place itself looks very bleak and we have to hang our tents well. If it ever storms up here, we would get blown to the far corners of the earth. And we hoped that tomorrow would be our big day. But that morning, things looked bad in camp. Tom and Hank were so sick they couldn't even move anymore. Leo complained of severe headaches and so did almost everybody else. It took forever just to get dressed and then it still took a lot of shouting, cursing and pushing until finally the six of us were outside and got ready to start the long climb to the North Peak. It looked like this might be our only chance. 
Already there were high clouds overhead and a cold north wind cut across this vast expanse while our two little tents looked rather lost and forlorn. Since it was so cold, Hans Schwartz set a fast pace. In one way I was glad he did, because this was the only chance to keep reasonably warm. The stretch to the summit was almost anticlimactic. Even though we walked along a sharp bridge, it was simple. And since the cloud has settled in, we missed the spectacular views below us, which we had experienced all the way up the Wickersham Wall. When we arrived on top, there was only Hans and myself. A little while ago, we had still seen one other fellow behind us. We didn't know who for sure it was. We stayed on top for about 20 minutes, but it became too miserable and minute by minute it began to snow harder and the wind started to blow more. It seemed as this might be the beginning of a big storm, so we started slowly down the mountain. Our friend had not shown up yet, but soon we saw him coming up through the fog and driving snow. He turned out to be Gunti Prince. Since we were just a little ways below the summit, Hans and I told him that we would wait here. Gunti went on to the top and when he came back the three of us went to camp. The other three who had started with us had given up because of exhaustion. And I remember one time he showed that film on the red shirt on the Amnaska, you know, where I, I tied up my shoelace and the, the thing was packed. There was people standing in the back. And uh, all of a sudden I, I stood up there and I realized my shoelace was open. And I just about slipped out of the shoe. I said, I can't have that. So I stood on this one leg, you know how steep it is there, and pulled up this thing and tied up the, the thing and put it back down and kept going. And Hans had uh, realized it from the back. He thought it was absolutely crazy, but I better not miss that shot. So he took the whole shot. Well, you, you will see it in one of those films. Yeah, you it's know. in the film. It's terrific. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, it, so that is not a fake scene. That's not no, staged. No, 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 no. And Hans said after that, Leo, are you nuts? He said, well, what choice did I have? Huh? Yeah, you got to do up your shoelace. I have to do up my shoelace. <laughs> That's quite a place to, to do it, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we had to do that climb two days in a row, twice. The, the one day Hans climbed with us in the middle of the rope, and Bob Albrecht was my guest. He was in the back, and I was in the front. And then the next day, Bob and I climbed it again, and Hans was on a rock outcrop, I don't know exactly where, with a long lens, and took a lot of those shots mm -hmm. that way. And then he put them all together and made a nice film out of it. Was it a big event when Hans came to town oh, with his films? Oh yeah, oh sure, everybody would go in Utah, then he would, yeah, I, I would see them in Utah, you know, the next fall and so on, and Hans would come down and spend a little time with us at Alta and ski with us a little bit. Too. What was he like as a presenter? Oh good, oh he was, he was good. I, 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 what I liked about Hans, well we, we frankly talked about that, he made his movies in the high mountains, you know, touring and uh, it was a little different than Warren and John Jay and, and uh, Dick Barrymore, but, but he made them up and up on the glaciers and uh, in the high mountains where there's no lifts or anything, which I really enjoyed. In that film? You do your most famous oh. little ski jumping trick. You, you could you describe that one? Well, we were sitting there looking at this, and uh, you know we'd been out filming in the morning, and I was kind of during the middle of the day we weren't doing it, and I was looking at that plane sitting there, and I thought you know it'd be a good idea if we could do a jump over the plane because there was a hill behind. So we all got together with uh, Hans had a we had a couple of snow shovels and skis, uh, and we built this jump all of us together. 
And we build it up and build it up. And I remember coming down, I'd put the skins on and climb up. And then I came down and at least three times before I knew I didn't have enough speed to get over it. But then the snow set up a little bit and it got a little faster. And I came down. I remember Jimmy, before we did the jump, he went up and took the propeller and turned it sideways so it wasn't sticking up like this because I went right over the whole the length of it. And, uh, but I had too much of a kicker like this. So when I hit it, it threw me back. And I went about 110 feet with my skis up in the air, you know, cleared the plane, but I landed like a bomb on the other side. And Hans had the whole thing in slow motion. And he used it in the film. <laughs> but then we took, we built it, we made it a little bit more or less uh, so much of a kicker this way. And I did about five or six good jumps over it. You know. That was fun. Yeah, it's, it, it's great. It's in, it's in the films yeah. and... Uh, that was in 62, so that's, that's over 50 years ago. 50 years ago, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Overnight, some fresh powder has fallen and they start one of their most thrilling runs in the two weeks they spend in the Northern Selkirks. And soon, the small cabin is really jumping as they recount their many stories. I remember one time, I don't know whether it was that particular time, but it was, Hans was cooking for 25 people and we're getting up at two o'clock in the morning and, and start climbing, you know, and we leave about a quarter to four. And, uh, I remember we came back at night and Hans had cooked a big meal and we were doing the dishes and there was a gal there obviously kind of uh, obviously probably lived by herself and she was used to doing things slowly and she was washing one prong of a fork at a time <laughs> and here's about five of us standing around waiting to dry and uh, Hans looked at her and he said what the hell are you doing? He said here's the way you do it. He picked up about 50 of them like this, dumped it in the water and he says there, if the dryer doesn't get it off, you can eat it off tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh great. Hans, he was something else. Oh, uh, he really was. The trip I remember most was uh, ski touring up Anniversary Peak. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, ski down through the, the peaks there, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that trip up Anniversary Peak is in one of the films. And as I remember, there's a kiss on the summit. Oh yeah, well that was very traditional for the Austrians to give the girls a kiss. Yeah, I think uh, any Austrian mountaineer would have done the same thing. Okay. <laughs> it, it, uh, were you surprised when Hans uh, gave It's a very passionate kiss. Oh, no, I wasn't surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Flying across the Conrad Ice Field, we approach our mountain. When I asked Jim, do you think you can land on top there? He said, no sweat, Hans. Well, perhaps not for him, but my hands felt a little damp just then. It was a long ways down wherever you looked, and when we finally landed on the summit, 
there was hardly enough room for us to get out and walk around the helicopter. There were quite a few fingerprints left on the bubble. On all sides, it drops off very steep. Jim simply lifted up, peeled off in a side slip, and disappeared over the vastness of the Conrad Ice Field. I, I always say I've never learned to ski properly. I've just, I'm always a mountain skier. I've always had a heavy pack on my back. I've always done that. And even though my life has been hinged around heli skiing and ski touring, um, I, I've never learned. In fact, at one stage, um, Brookie Dodge, who was one of Hans's first clients, who was an Olympic skier, tried to get me to slow down. Cause he knew that I could do maybe six or eight turns and then I'd get a head of steam up and then I would count wrong. In fact, it became a standard joke. And I think Hans hired me as the comic relief because he'd stay down with the gas, get down about two or three hundred feet and say, come on, Keely, come on down. And of course, everybody get their cameras on. And I'd come roaring down. And of course, after six or seven turns, I'd crash. And you have to realize I've got a heavy pack on, got the ice axe sticking out there. And I would do a crash, and normally I'd come up again and ski another few turns, crash again, and, and I'd just keep rolling down. But, you know, I was young and strong, and I could take lots of that. And um, so Brookie would take me aside and try and get me to uh, slow down my turns. And I think he gave up after a while and said, let him go. He'll learn one day. And so I think I took thousands of crashes up there in the mountains and lucky I uh, never hurt myself. Well, you know, uh, there was a lot of uh, fun things that we did on that trip and uh, uh, that uh, that bike trip or the bike that I was on, uh, uh, I do remember uh, uh, getting the Kokanee because uh, that was one of my favorite beers at the time. And, um, you know, riding down that gravel with uh, skis and the big pack and uh, uh, it was a little shaky. It was. Well, when you take that tumble, it looks like a real tumble. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, you know, uh, I think at that time, and best of my knowledge on that, uh, we had, he wanted some footage of, and I didn't really plan to fall. But um, I got out in the loose gravel, and there it was. Winter, and so we just, uh, from then on, uh, you know, he, we kept on with the, the whole movie. We didn't restart it. We just, it became what it was. And, uh, you know, then after a while, uh, you know, I'm limping around there because I did just smack my knee pretty good there. So it took a little while to get the, that, the kinks out of it. But, you know, that we were young and it was not that big a deal. Gosh, we, we, we would climb up and uh, do some filming. And I remember one time we were going up and there was this, big ice with the snow on it, but it was a big jump. And I looked at Scotty and I said, Scotty, did you see that uh, bump there? And he said, yeah. I said, I think we better uncork one there on the way down. Because <laughs> it was a steep, steep landing, just almost like a jump hill. You could, and you could just fly, oh, you'd go 100 feet, and then you'd just feather in like you hardly even feel the landing because it was so steep. But then you had to get it under control down below. And I remember Scotty, he, I went over first, and, and, and then Scotty came. And uh, what impressed me was Scotty, he landed, and then he cranked in some turns on that steep hill, which uh, I had to let it go out a little further before I could start doing that, but... His feet on solid ground again, he comes up to where Franz and I were sitting on a narrow ledge. Beyond Leo, we can look far into the valley and out over the distant mountains. From here, it is 150 feet to the top, and again, I have to go ahead while Leo runs the camera. A short stretch up to another piton and then a traverse to the right. Thank you. 
When Franz had brought the camera up, I was able to catch Leo on the last lead of the day. To the south, it looked very cloudy and ominous. While to the west, we had a magnificent view of Pigeon Spire and the Hauser Towers, the most impressive peaks in the Bagaboos. This is where we have been on skis a few months earlier. When Lilo comes up, she gets a big kiss from Leo. And Franz doesn't want to miss out on that either. I got one too. Leo walks now to the true top of Snowpad Spire. Lilo was very happy, she said. It was the best climb she ever did. It certainly was a tremendous climb in a fantastic setting. The mountain was first climbed in 1940, and since then about 30 more ascents have been registered. In addition, there are also new routes up this mountain, some of them much, much more difficult than the way we had come up. We all sign our name in the book and then start the descent. This we do by rappelling. The rope is snapped into the carabiner, goes around your shoulder, and then you can simply walk down the steep rocks. When we awoke the next morning, eight inches of snow covered the landscape around us. It looked almost like winter, and were we ever glad that we had done our climb? Now, it would be out of the question. Who knows, winter might have set in for good, and it won't be long before the deep snow blanket will have silenced the rushing creeks and waterfalls, and the bugaboos will pierce the clear winter sky in their frozen splendor, while the skiers climb up those snowy flanks bound for new adventures. They come back time and time again. It is almost like a ritual, a religion. There is no tangible benefit from all these adventurous journeys into the mountains. The thrills are as short and as fleeting as a jump through the air, a quick turn in the powder. It is the memories which stay with us, like a light glowing in the background when everything else around us has become gray and dreary. Those memories linger on, and in times of need, they can make our hearts leap just as high and as far as the spirit of adventure makes these people leap on their skis now.